This is the third video, or day three, of functions. And I want to start today by talking about the composition. So for this one, we need three sets, A, B, and C, B sets. And then we have two different functions. I'll say and F is a function from A to B. G, oh, well, maybe I could put an and here, and, and G, it's a funny looking A, and G is a function from B to C, R functions. So we define the function composition Maybe the blue is a better color. This is going to be, let's see, G, compose F. First you do F and then you do G. So F maps from A to B and then you do G. G goes from B to C like this. So this is going to be a function with the same domain as F and the same codomain as G. But this is defined via G of F of X equals, oh, this is the definition. G composed F at X is this, for all X and A. Okay? So this You've probably seen this before um, in classes, right? You first you move by F, then you move by G. And quite often in the function world, as you know, I will draw pictures. So let's look at a picture here. Now what example do I want to do? We will have maybe one, two, three, four. One, two, three, and four. This will be my set A. And then we will have two, three, four, and five. Two, three, four, and five is my set B. And then my set C is just two and seven. This is B, this is C. And now I need to draw some arrows for each function. Let's see, F goes like the, as follows. F maps like this. One, F of one is two, two goes to, two goes to three, uh, three goes to four, and four goes to three. Okay, and then, this is F, and then G, maybe I will do this one in red, G sends two and four to seven, and the other ones to two. And then five and three go to two. Okay, this is G. Now, um, let's write out these as ordered pairs because that's another way that we can think about functions. So notice here F, now that I have the picture, I can figure out the ordered pairs. F has one relates to two. It has um, two relates to three. Four relates to three. And three relates to four. G has um, two relates to seven. Four relates to seven, three relates to two, and five relates to two. And then we could, okay, I like looking at it both ways. To get G compose F, first you move by F, okay, then you move by G. So one, if you look at this, goes two, and then it goes to seven. So when we write out, okay, G compose F. We get one relates to seven, okay? 
just follow this and then we follow this. And then if what does two relate to? Goes three, two. So two maps to two. Mm, here, three maps to four, maps to seven. So three maps to seven. And then finally, four maps to three, three maps to two. So four maps to two. Okay. And we could draw the picture for this if we wanted to. Okay, maybe why not? This is my first example. We could just list the elements here. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it jumped out at me. Okay, and then we could list the elements. This is now A. And then we could list the elements here. This is now C. And C has two and seven. And then we just map, G, we draw the picture for decompose F, which maybe I'll do this one even in another color. One maps to seven, but then, um, oh, do I have that one maps to seven? Two maps to two, three maps to seven, four maps to two. Okay. Two maps to two, I think I have something different in my notes. Three maps to seven and four maps to two, like this. Okay, what did I do differently here? I have two goes to seven. Oh, no, my notes are wrong. Sometimes that happens. I have the same picture, but somehow I concluded something wrong. But without a doubt, two goes to two. Okay, wonderful. Well, in any case, this would be the picture for decompose up like this. And you see, um, okay. This is the composition. There's two ways you can think about it. Ordered pairs, always. These are relations or pictures like this. Uh, we can also think about it as formulas, uh, like f of x is x squared plus 1, that kind of thing. I'll do that in a moment. But before I do, let's think about some things here. So what is the um, domain of G? And this is an important thing to think about. The domain of G, in our situation, it's 2, 3, 4, and 5. Okay, this is B, right? And what is the image of F? The image of F. Well, for this one, it's, it's, two, three, and four, right? It's just things that are actually hit, and, and five is not, you can also see it by looking at the relation. Five is not a second coordinate appearing in F. So the image of F is two, three, and four. And you notice that this is a subset of the domain of G. In fact, maybe I will put this in a box right here because Kind of out of space. I'll put this in a box and then I will erase. In order for this to be defined, we must have that exactly this, that the image of F is a subset of the domain of G. Otherwise, you can't define it. For example, even in this um, relation, let me erase the definition and we'll look at the same example a little further. We erase the definition. Oh, here it is. We erase this part. Uh-oh, oh, yeah, that's okay, part of the definition. If we think about the exact same functions, but we want to think about going the other way, so it would be F composed G, can we do it in this situation? Okay, let's think about it. Can we do F composed G? And I'm going to say no, and why is that? Oh, this isn't turning out so well. My attempt to erase. Okay, 
In this example, and this will maybe be a note, in this example, F composed G is not defined. You would go have two goes to seven. Okay, fine. But now what happens? So the image of G the domain of F and seven is not in the domain of F. And because of that, so as, because of this, seven is not in the domain of F, which means that if we try to define this, F compose G of, well, find something that maps to seven. Two is undefined. It has no value which means this is not going to be a function because for everything in the domain, which would be the domain of G, it would have to have a value, or it has to be in an ordered pair. Two comma something must be in this relation if we can make it one. But two goes to seven, we have nowhere to map seven. So this is an example where you can't just compose in each direction. In order for the composition to be defined, we absolutely must have this statement that whatever's happening first, the image of it must be a subset of the domain of whatever you're gonna follow by second, and we see that here. Okay, okay, so my comments. Let's draw a picture, and this is just thinking about things that we have here. So we have A, we have B, we have C. And then F maps here, and then let's say G maps here. Now what do we have in this situation? Well, and then, well, okay, I'll even draw here. What's happening first? F, decompose F, like this. Okay, so now let's think about the sets happening here. First of all, we have A, and you notice that both F and decompose F start at A. So A is the domain of F, and this always matches the domain of G composed F. Always, okay? Because both of them are functions that start at A. Okay, now let's go over here to this, all the way over here, we have C. Now, in this example, maybe it's good I left up half of the board to talk about it, you see that G is onto right? So that the image of G is all of C, but that's not necessary. We, it will be the case that the image of G is contained in C, and then if you look at the image of the whole thing, well, you don't know exactly. And in, in this case, this one that, that, that I um, I erased G compose F over here, but you can see we get both 2 and 7 in the image. For instance, 1 maps to 7 and 2 maps to 2, right? So both come in the image of G compose F, but generally it's just some subset. It doesn't have to be equal. You could come up with examples with only a few things in A, B, and C where they're not the same. Okay, and then there's this thing here in the middle, which is B. And this is, without a doubt, the domain of G, okay? And what is required is that the image of F must be a subset of, well, you can either say the domain or just B. These are the same thing, okay? We must have this. This is what is needed here. This part is needed right here, right, in order for this composition to um, be defined. Now, here's another comment, which is another quite important one in the beginning, our understanding of composition, is as follows. Let's suppose that they're both defined. 
F compose G and G compose F are both defined. Okay? And sometimes they are. Well, there's no need for them to be equal. F compose G is not always equal, may not equal G compose F. Sometimes they're equal, sometimes they're not, but it's not a general statement that, oh, well, if they both exist, they're equal. No, it's not, and let's look at an example, and I will have to erase, <laughs> I don't know how much of it I can fit down here, but let's look at F of X is X squared plus one, and G of X is um, X plus one. Okay, that's fine. Or let's just do x squared and x squared plus 1. Okay, doesn't really matter. The other one would have worked, but this is fine. It's a little simpler. <laughs> x squared and x squared plus 1. Now, you can think of f as a function from r to r, even though we know it's not onto r. The codomain of f is just um, non-negative real numbers. And you can consider g as a function from r to r. Um, certainly the, the image of F is a subset of R, the image of um, G is a subset of R, and so the criterion that you need for G compose F and F compose G to both be defined works in this situation, okay? Now, this is something that you probably have experienced in a course where you thought about composition before. Uh, we can compute F compose G and G compose F. Okay, so let's do it and then we're going to have to talk about how do we know that these two are not equal, which is another important topic of this today's discussion. Okay, so let's just compute. So when we have, maybe I'll recopy them here. This is X squared and G of X is x plus 1, and then how do you compute g compose f? Well, this is by definition like this, and then you just put the entire f of x in 4x. So this is x squared plus 1, okay? And then f compose g at x, this would be 4x in R. Either one of them because F compose G and G compose F in this case would have the same domain if we look at the functions over here. Here, this is, um, okay, well it's F of G of X, which is you put all of G of X into X squared, okay? Now, of course, if you think to your knowledge of functions, you can look at these and know that these are not equal because here you would, you would multiply this out and you know that it's not this. But let's go back to, to this course and, and ask yourself, where we think about functions as being relations, what does it mean for two functions to be equal? Mm, that's a question. It's a question. How do you know, or I should say, in this case, they're not equal. How do you know they aren't equal? Because, I mean, generally, you could have two really different formulas, but they're the same, like tangent of x, okay? Somebody might say that. Somebody else might say, well, I'm gonna say sine x over cosine x, unless you know that they're the same, right? Okay, or, you, or even you get something more complicated with trick identities or something like this where they look um, different, but they're actually the same. So let's talk about this for a moment. How do we actually know this question mark? Okay, well let's, if you go all the way to the beginning, functions are relations. They are subsets of a function from A to B is a subset.
subset of A cross B. That's the definition. And so, of course, two functions will be equal, well, if they're the same set as a subset of a relation. But um, that we don't have to write out the set or show set equality, which would be subset in each direction, for instance, every time we want to prove that two functions are equal. Okay, that would be a lot more work than we need. So that's what I want to discuss now. How do we prove two functions are equal? And once we know that, we would be able to know when two functions are not equal, or be able to prove or disprove. Disproving they're equal is the same as proving they're not equal, right? Okay, so, well, I don't have an answer yet. So let's say to prove two functions, f1 and f2 are equal. Well, there's two things to being equal. We need number one, that the domain of f1 equals the domain of f2, okay? And then for every and, and, and for every x in this common domain, they agree. F1 of x equals F2 of x, okay? So this is how we show two functions are equal. Okay, well, two functions are equal is an and, right? So let's just discuss, while I erase this panel over here, how we would show two functions are not equal, which is the question that I have written in black. Okay, well, it becomes an or. If you negate this, it's an or. It says either they have different domains. Okay, sure. Okay, then you're done. Or, let's say they have the same domain, then this becomes a there exists. So you need to find one element in the common domain that the function values are different. Okay, then you will know you are not equal as functions. So either they have the different domains, that's the easier case, you're done. Or you find there, the for all becomes a there exists when you negate this and this becomes not equal, like I said. Okay, so let's prove that these two are not equal to see that in this case, g composed f of x is not equal to f composed g of x, okay? Well, they have the same domain. Note that the domain is the real numbers for both, but let's pick something. Um, and don't pick one. That's not going to work. And don't pick what else won't work. Don't pick zero. But let's pick two. But two is a real number. And g composed f of two is equal to. Oh, no, you could pick one. Maybe that would have been easier. One would have just say that would be two, and that would be two squared. Oh, okay. You just can't pick zero. It's okay. We'll do two. g composed f of two is... 2 squared plus 1, which is 5. And then f composed g of 2 is 2 plus 1 squared, which is 9. And 5 is not equal to 9. Okay? So this justifies these two um, being different functions, right? And we also, this is something that we need to use, this idea, proving two functions are equal. It allows us to really justify that those are not the same function. 
Okay, so. that will come up a, a, a lot. This will be a definition. Let A be a set. Okay? And then I'm going to define the identity, the identity function on A and it has the following notation. It's I D sub A. This maps A to itself, and this satisfies that the identity of A of any X is X for all X in A. Okay. This is the identity function or the identity map. And, well, it's not that exciting in terms of what's happening. Maybe I'll draw a picture and then I will, I'm gonna go get a darker black marker <laughs> from the office so that it comes out a little clearer. But let's draw a picture here. Okay, here's A, you map to itself. Now, it doesn't matter what A is. It can be any set and it has an identity. Let me just put one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four elements in A, let's suppose. Although A could be infinite or finite, doesn't matter. We have the identity map like this. And the map just maps, okay, straight across. One goes to one, two goes to two, three goes to three, Four goes to four. Another way you could write this, where could I put it? Um, maybe right above. And then I will we'll get some darker markers. I can put it right here. Ooh. As we could write the identity map as a relation, because it is a relation, we can write it as follows. I, D, A. As a relation, it consists of all, let's say, X comma X, such that X is in A. And this was, this is a relation we actually looked at during our equivalence relation um, times where this was what I would call the diagonal elements, and it's the smallest equivalence relation on any set because it's, it's reflexive, but then it's also symmetric and transitive. In any case, in our function world, which is what we are doing right now, this is the identity map. It only consists of these pairs. So in this case, it would be 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, and 4, 4. And then I just put the definition up here of what we just talked about, about the identity. Okay. Well, what do we see, for example, here? We see we have a proposition. Is if you have, in this case, if you have A, B sets, and F is a function from A to B, then, we have the following that if you take, let's see, first you go by F, then you go by the identity on B, so this would go A to B, and then you move by the identity that this is equal to F. And, let's see, first you do the identity on A, that takes you to A, then you do F, this is F. Now, maybe I'll only prove one of these, and maybe even before I do that, let's draw a picture. What's happening here? Which one do we want to work with? Let's say here, A, A, and then F maps A to B. So I'm talking about this one. Maybe this is the one I'll prove. Okay, 
And I don't know what these are, what F is. It's just an example. The theorem or proposition is true in general. Okay. And then B maybe only has three elements. So say this is one, two, three, four. One, two, three, and four. And then this could be seven, eight, and nine, for example. Now let's draw F is something, right? In this case, I'll just draw some arrows. One goes to eight, two goes to seven, and three also goes to eight. Okay, oh, I need something for four. <laughs> Let's say four goes to nine. Now I have a function. Well, the identity, it just maps one to one, two to two, three to three, four to four. And you see, if first you do the identity, then f, well, f has one goes to eight, or f of one is eight, right? And then this says, this composition, f composed identity of one is also eight, right? And then here, two to seven, same as two to seven. Three to eight, same as three to eight, like this. It's the same as just f. And now perhaps we will prove just this one, because the proof of the identity on B composed F being F is almost the same. So the proof of just this, that F composed identity on A is F. Okay, well, this goes back to how do you show two functions are equal? First of all, they need to have the same domain. Well, we know the domain of F composed identity on A is the same as the domain on of identity on A. Okay, it's always the domain of the first one because that's what you do first. First, first one that happens. And I don't mean first reading left to right. I mean the first function that happens, which is this one. This is A. And the domain here of F is A. Oops, A. And so we see so this is what we're trying to prove. This is number one. And so we see, thus, the domain of F composed identity on A is equal to the domain of F. That's step one. We're showing two functions are equal. Step two, you let X be in the common domain, which is A. And then we need to show, okay, sorry. We need to show that they agree, okay? Well, F compose identity on A of X equals F of identity on A of X. And this is the identity, so that's just like this. Okay, so you see that this and this, they agree because this is exactly what this says. <laughs> Um, thus, they're equal as a function. So we have shown F composed identity on A equals F. It wasn't too terribly hard, and the other direction goes almost the same. Okay, now there's another proposition I will mention. So next, consider F which goes from A to B, A bijection. Now, what did we prove at the end of last time? We proved if you have a bijection, this is if and only if F inverse is a, maybe I'll put this in parentheses somewhere, here. We know that F inverse in this case is B to A is a function. This is equivalent to F being a bijection. And one thing I forgot to mention, but now is a perfect time, is that when this happens, F is called invertible. F is called invertible. So we had the proof of this and um, that this and this are equivalent in video two. Okay, well consider you have a bijection, then the inverse is a function. 
Okay, so what is the case? So the proposition in this case is that first we go by F and then by F inverse. So first by F, then by F inverse. This will be, well, F goes from A to B, and then F inverse goes from B to A. This is a function from A to A. And that, well, I don't have a proposition yet. Maybe I will just state what I'm going to state, that I can make the proposition, or I will talk about the proposition a little bit. And then it, we could go F inverse first and then compose F. And this would go, F inverse starts at B, and then it goes to B. Okay. Now the proposition is that this is the identity on A, and this is the identity on B, meaning that this and this are equal as functions. Okay. So maybe I will state that and I will tell you where you can go look at it. Mm. Yeah, I'll state it and then I will make a comment. Okay, let me erase some. Um, Then we'll do an example. Okay. Now I'll state the proposition, although it's basically stated here, but I will state it here. Suppose F from A to B is invertible. Then F composed F inverse equals identity on B and um, F inverse composed F equals identity on A. So let's consider the following. 1, 4, 2, 7, 3, 5, and 4 comma 10. What do we know about F? Well, we could write out some things here. The domain of F is 1, 2, 3, 4. The image of F is um, 4, 7, 5, 10. And you see that F is invertible. Um, you can see it by looking at the picture, which I will do maybe small. We have one, two, three, four. This is my A. And then if I let this be B, it would be four, five, seven, ten. Okay, this is B. And then F maps like this, 2 to 7, and then 3 to 5, and then 4 to 10. And you see this is both 1 to 1 and on 2. Okay, well let's write F inverse, and then we will write, we will calculate from the relations F compose F inverse and F inverse compose F to illustrate this proposition. But as I said, you can see the proof in the other video. So F inverse, 4 goes to 1, 7 goes to 2, 5 goes to 3, and 10 goes to 4. Okay, so now let's calculate. Um, we'll do it here. Yeah, we have space. Let's calculate F composed F inverse. Now, this is a nice exercise in doing the composition just by looking at the, the relations. Okay, so how would I do this? We start with F inverse here, and 
here's the everything in the domain of f inverse. The set of all first coordinates of ordered pairs is here. We see. Okay. So you start, and in this relation, you have to figure out where does 4 map to, where does 7 map to, where does 5 map to, and where does 10 map to. So here, first you move by f, inverse, then by f. 4 goes to 1, 1 goes to 4. So 4 goes to 4. Okay. 7 goes to 2, 2 goes to 7. So 7 goes to 7. 5 goes to 3, 3 goes to 5. And finally, 10 goes to 4, 4 goes to 10. This would be 10 comma 10, like this, okay? And then the last one, hmm, now maybe I won't, I think I will move now rather than going below. We will get the same thing or the similar thing. We are calculating, we will calculate F inverse, compose F, and we should see that we get go. We should get the identity. This time it'll be the identity on, on uh, A. So if we first go by F, then we go by F inverse. Well, it's the same kind of exercise, except you start with F, and now maybe in green I will underline, here's the domain of F. It's all first coordinates, so we will need to figure out in, in this, where does 1 go, 2 go, 3 and 4? Okay, so 1 goes to 4, 4 goes to 1. So we see 1, 1 is a part of this relation. And then here, 2 goes to 7, 7 goes to 2, we see 2, 2. And then 3 goes to 5, 5 goes to 3, 3, 3. And finally, shouldn't be a surprise, given the proposition, 4 goes to 4, 10 goes to 4. But I still wanted to see it in a concrete example because this is a nice way to practice composition looking at the two relations. Okay, so in fact, we see just looking at ordered pairs that this is the identity on B as the proposition states that better be, and this is the identity on A, for example. Okay? Okay, so now, there is um, one more thing that I'd like to do, as I mentioned. I think I can write it here, then I'll erase to work on the proof, perhaps. Okay. The next thing I'm going to do is actually quite an important, <laughs> I say that all the time, everything's important but it's quite important in something you can use. So if you wanted to show a function invertible or equivalently show that the function is a bijection, well, you know one thing that you can do. You can show that it is 1 to 1 and on 2, and then as a bijection. Oh, maybe I'll erase the whole thing because I'm speaking, and then we can start with a fresh board. So one, one way to show a function is invertible, as I said, is the definition. Show it's a bijection by showing it's both one to one and onto. But there's another way, which is the statement of our next theorem. And it's something that we will prove. And the other way is sometimes easier. Sometimes it's easier to prove something's invertible. Um, The way I'm about to state. Okay. But we will prove it, and it's a really fun proof, in my opinion. You have to really wrap your brain around composition and things like this, and functions being equal. Okay. So here is the theorem. We have two sets, and f is a function from a to b. We're going to say with f is a function from a to b, and g is a function from b to a. Okay, and then the statement is if f compose g 
equals the identity on, well, we're starting with G, this would be B, and G compose F equals the identity on A, then F is invertible. So there's two things here. One is F is invertible. And the other thing is that G is, in fact, the inverse. Okay, now, why would this be um, something that could be easier for you? Sometimes it's difficult to prove something is onto, or it's difficult to prove something is one to one. But what this says is, is to prove that a function is invertible or equivalently a bijection. Well, it says you just need to find another function, like say you're given it, find some other function such that when you compose in each direction, you get the two respective identities. And then you're done. You know it's one to one and onto, and in fact that you found the inverse. Okay. So maybe before I start the proof of this, let's draw a little picture and then we will talk about what we need in the proof. So a little picture is here. We have A, we have B. <laughs> and these could be anything, they're just some kind of sets, and we know that F maps like this from A to B, and G moves in the other direction like this from B to A. Okay. And then we know that when you go do this, F, first F, then G, you get the identity. First G, then F, you get the identity like this. Okay, well now what do we need to show? We need to show three things, in fact. Number one, invertible is really two things. Okay, well, we need to show it's one, two, one. We need to show F is on to. And these two together say invertible. Okay. And then we still need to show our third thing, which is that in fact G equals F inverse. And we talked about how do you show two functions are equal. We will do this. Okay. So let's get to it. The proof. Well, the first thing I'm going to prove is this part. F is one to one. Now, how do you show something's one to one? Well, let's do it. You take X and Y in. We're trying to show F is one to one. F, I'm going to underline it, is a function from A to B here. So that means this is the domain. This is the codomain. We take X and Y in the domain with f of x equals f of y. And then we want to show x equals y. Remember, I think this was the first video, I put a little box with stars around this. This is always the way we begin, showing something is one to one. You take two elements of the domain with the function value being equal. You must show they are equal. Okay, well, how are we going to do this? Okay, g is a function, and as f of x equals f of y, g of f of x will equal g of f of y, because this is the same input, right? And there's only one thing it maps to. That's definition of a function. We can rewrite this, rewriting. We have that g compose f of x equals g compose f of y. Okay, wonderful. Now I will put a line. 
I should have moved that a little, but that's okay here. Okay, so then as G compose F equals the identity on A, we have the following that X is G compose F of X and Y is G compose F of Y. And so we see here, so thus, these two are the same. And so this is really saying X equals Y. X equals Y, okay? Comma, and F is what you want. This is what I needed for one to one, and I have established it. So we have proved the first thing. Now for the second one. We must show F is on two. And again, how do you show something's on two? Well, we take something in the codomain. So you start like this, let B in B. And then we need to find an A in A such that F of A equals B. This was the thing I had put in a box, put stars like this during video number, don't remember, maybe two, something like this, how you show something is on two. Okay, let's do it. So B is in B. Okay, now is when we really have to look at the picture. So we are sitting over here in B. And this could make you think I have no idea because I don't know what F is. How am I gonna find something in A that maps to B. It's sitting here. Here I am. <laughs> well, the only thing we can possibly do with B is to get something in A is use our function G. So we are going to let A equal G of B. And this is definitely, so notice A is an A because G is a function from B to A. So you take something here, you map with G, you are in A. And what else do we have? If we evaluate F of A, we get F of G of B, which is F composed G of B. And this is B. Or I'll, maybe I'll make a new sentence. I'll say as um, as F composed G equals the identity on B, we see F of A, which is F composed G of B, is B. Okay? So thus, F is on two. That's what we needed. We found something. We mapped here, got an element of A that satisfies um, F of A is B. And this is what I need. Oh, I meant to use blue for the discussion, but that's okay. Okay, so now I have one more thing to show. Maybe now for, I'll move to blue just to separate my parts one, two, and three. I need to show these two functions are equal. And this involves two things. And the first thing is, now I know, okay, first of all, what have we proved? We know F is invertible by here. We know the inverse relation is a function, and it's a function from B to A, right? All of that comes from just parts one and two, showing that it's what one and not two. So now it just takes, this exists, as a function, and it maps from B to A, we just need to show that these two functions agree. Okay, so we have the domain of G is uh, B, and this is the also the image 
maybe I will make this two sentences, is I'll make this two statements rather than just equals. Moreover, that the domain of G is B, moreover, as the image of F is B, we have the domain of F inverse is equal to B, okay? And so now we just need to, so now, we let X in, or B, maybe I'll say, let B in, I'll call it X. In B, we need to show that F of X, oh, excuse me, F inverse of X is G of X. And this will be the final step, not only in part three, it will show these two functions are equal, but in this theorem. Okay. Well, how are we going to do this? I, there's a few things we could do. I personally, so I'm over here, right? This is X. I personally am going to use, I'm going to use that F as onto, find something in A. I've already proved it's onto, right? And then I'll use that. So we'll see that here. So as, this for me personally is an easier way to go about showing these agree. As F is onto, there exists A and A with F of A equals this X. Okay, then we have the following F inverse of X equals F inverse of F of A which is F inverse composed F of A. We know this is A. This is by that proposition that you need to, that I stated as F composed F inverse is the identity on A. And finally, um, G of X, is g of f of x, excuse me, oh no, this should be f of a, oh, it's hard to erase, g of x, okay, g of x equals, well, x is f of a, okay, now we are good, f of a, this is g composed f of a, and this is a, as g composed f, equals the identity on A, okay? So therefore, we have shown that F inverse of X equals, so thus, F inverse of X equals G of X. Meaning, I think I have space here, <laughs> not very much, that F inverse equals G. Oh, goodness, F inverse equals G. Okay, so this was this proof, which was a little bit involved, but it was quite fun. And what it means, um, like I said, that you can show something's invertible just by finding something and composing in each direction to get the identity. You'll know it's invertible. I was checking our time. I think I'm gonna actually do an example of this rather than ending on something abstract, okay? So let me erase. I was going to finish this proof and end, but I think, I mean, this is a video, right? So if I make it a few minutes longer, it's not gonna hurt anything, and we will get to see this in action through an example. Let's consider F, which is gonna be a map from Q to Q. This is rational numbers, and I define it as follows, 2X plus four. Now, there's no reason I needed to use Q. I could have used R. Um, well, I even could have used Z, but not if I wanted it to be invertible.
convertible. <laughs> uh, that's important. Well, I could have even used N, but again, not if I wanted it to be invertible. Okay, now let's prove F is a bijection, or another way to say that is invertible. Now, I am not going to prove it's one to one and on to. In fact, I think this one we already proved was one to one. Um, and I could, it's not too terribly bad, but I'm purposefully using the last theorem. So let's do some side work, maybe over here. I'll do it in green. Some side work. Because what I need to do to use the last theorem is I need to find a function such that, I find a function of g such that f compose g is the identity and g compose f is the identity. And then we will get that f is invertible or bijection. Well, what I would do, and this is something that you might have done in a math class in the past, is I'm just trying to find the inverse, really. I just solve for x. So one way to write this, you could have that um, 2x is y minus 4, and then I can divide 1 half y minus 2. This is my side work box. Okay, it's not a part of my proof, really, although I will use this function. It's just a little calculation I've done on the side. Okay, so let's consider, so proof, consider um, G, which maps from Q to Q, defined by G of Y, equals one half y minus two. Okay, this is definitely a function. If you take two, well, it's a function from q to q, you could prove um, using the arithmetic of, of, of rational numbers that this is a rational number. In fact, that's not too terribly hard to do. Okay, so then or we have as follows that, well, if we take F compose G, this is going to take in a Y. I'm going to use two different letters, although I could have used X instead of Y here. It wouldn't really matter. Okay, this says I stick this into, into X. Okay, so I have 2. 1 half Y minus 2 plus 4. And this equals, this is a y minus 4 plus 4 equals y. Um, maybe I should have said we have 4y and q, comma, that this is true. Oh, this is y. <laughs> you can tell it's getting late in the video. My brain stopped working. <laughs> okay, so 4y and q, f composed of y is y. Thus, F compose G is the identity, okay? And similarly, we have to check the other direction. So also, let's say for X in Q, um, G compose F of X equals, well now, I put in F of X to G. Okay, this would be one half that I put in all of this. This is G of F of X. One half, then you put in all of F of X, and then minus two, and now we should get X out of this. This is X plus two minus two. This is X. Okay, thus, G compose F is the identity on Q, okay? And so using the last theorem, I didn't have a number on it, but the last one that we proved, we see that F is invertible or equivalently a bijection or equivalently a bijection. 
and in particular that, that this G is F inverse. I mean, I sort of use that to find the right G to work with, but this is a way to use that theorem. We get the same conclusion, bijection, even though we never showed um, specifically that F was one-to-one -one and onto. We use this other way of proving something's a bijection.